victim blaming in cult communities, that's an even bigger problem. Because you're very linked to the communities. There are some kind of different values in the societies where we have families that are very much close to um, each other. We have big extended families. Um, if you leave that family, you leave the whole community behind you. Um, the question again, why doesn't she leave? Because you come to a new country with those big hopes and big dreams and really uh, planning big future for your family and for your children. That's the last thing that you want to do to break down that family. So I think the issues are more or less the same, except that uh, there are probably three major things that have impact that are very important for women from migrant and ethnic background. That's their pre-migration experiences and the experiences in the country of origin, the settlement and the stage of the settlement that they're in, whether they're newly arrived or um, being in an established community, and then at the end of that also the cultural context and how religion or cultural norms and beliefs can play the role on um, the experience of family violence. And any strategies that you can tell us about that your organisation is undertaking to better respond to women and children? What we are generally trying to do is that we are taking approaches that are already developed in the mainstream communities and see if we can adapt them or adjust them to meet the needs of culturally diverse communities. Or in some of the cases, you really have to come up with a completely different approaches. And what we see happening most of the time is that you have the mainstream approach and then you have Indigenous disability mm -hmm. cult approach, which really doesn't mean anything. Cult stands for more than 200 different communities that we have here. And what might work in Sudanese community will probably not work in Indian community. So the approaches have to be, we have to be very careful about how we tailor the approaches. We recently did a big prevention project in four different communities, Indian, Sudanese, Croatian and Vietnamese. And while the model was the same, based on the community engagement and upskilling community leaders to become agents of change within their own communities, we actually engaged bilingual facilitators, we partnered with the ethnic ethno-specific agencies and created specific task forces within those communities. So we upskill them to do the work within the frameworks that we all work within, but we really wanted them to come up with a solution and tell us what would work in their own communities. Great, thank you. So Rodney, what do you think? Are we blaming it all on men, uh, media, uh, women, uh, the society? as equally to blame? What do you think? Um, sure, thanks, thanks, Fiona. And I think I'd just like to start off and answering that question by saying that what I'll be saying is is nothing new. You know, incredibly powerful women like Rosie and advocates like you know Fiona and Maya have been saying these things for decades. So what I'm going to say now is, is nothing new at all. For me and, and for my sisters and brothers and the organisations that I, I work with, this is something that all men do need to take responsibility for. And it's something where the buck does need to stop with us. In the experience of the uh, organisations that we support that try to work with men in the very difficult work of trying to invite them to stop using their violence, we discover that men use violence because of a sense of entitlement. You know, men are no different in some ways to all of us. We have very intense, powerful emotions. We have horrible things happening in our lives. And we have some very sometimes distorted thoughts. But unfortunately, men have been conditioned by our culture, by so many cultures and societies, to have a sense of the victim is me. And that I'm entitled to particular things. And when my partner doesn't give me what I think I'm entitled to, then I'm entitled to punish to punish her, that there's a big sense of, of, for many of the men who use violence, of having some expectations of what their family should do for them. And when they think those expectations aren't met, they lock on to those thoughts. They lock on to, this isn't fair, why is she doing this to me? We see that with the men that we work with in, in the Men's Behaviour Change programs. 
a sense of entitlement, a sense of sexist attitudes towards women. And why it's an issue for all men is that I believe that all of us men benefit from the privilege of sometimes having these entitlement-based attitudes. And that if we're going to stop men's violence against women, it's about, as men, identifying how might we be benefiting from that gender privilege? How might we be benefiting from that sense of entitlement? And I'll just give a, a very little, little example. I think a lot of new fathers have a very different experience in becoming a parent than new mums. I don't know about you, but in many heterosexual relationships, who is it usually that decides, oh, which sort of pram are we going to buy that's actually going to fit in the, the tram so that we can take it? It's usually who. Who does the research about which form of modern cloth nappies to buy? It's usually who. Who um, still does most of the housework when she does go back to work after the birth of her child, if she's in a heterosexual relationship? It's still usually, usually her. When a relationship's in difficulty or needs a bit of work, who is it that notices it first? It's her. And that's part of that entitlement and privilege that particular work is seen as women's work. And us as men, we just don't worry about it. And we just leave it for her to do. And furthermore, we may expect things from her that, well, why do we expect them? And that's where gender inequality comes in. It comes in from centuries and centuries of unequalness, whereas men, we don't even think about it. We don't even think about how much we're speaking. We don't need to think about, is it safe to, to walk tonight to catch, a, to catch a train or not? We don't have to be so self-conscious about, about ourselves in public spaces. We don't have to watch dark shadows walking at, at night. We don't have to self-doubt ourselves about whether something we think or feel is something really genuine or whether really we're taking up somebody else's space. Men, we just take space. It's part of the entitlement and privilege. So I think this is very much an issue for us men to look at, not only with the very visible ways that we reinforce sexism, not only with all of the sexist comments and jokes that we just let fly, or all of those attitudes in our workplace that both the Minister and the Chief Commissioner were talking about. It's also those less visible ways in which we express our entitlement and privilege that we can have a responsibility to notice and watch and start doing some of the work that we often leave for women and leave women to have the space that, that women do, deserve for themselves and their, their children. Yeah. Yes, I, I do think it is possible for some men, but not for all men. There are certainly some men who I think are probably so dangerous in some of those attitudes and beliefs uh, that a men's behaviour change program may not actually change their behaviour. And for those men, it's about the system working together. It's about you know, all of us, and, you know, police and courts and child protection and corrections and community workers and GPs, being able to work together so that he knows that if he oversteps the line in his behaviour, he's going to be watched. So often, we women are the ones that need to flee. Women are the ones that need to adjust to his behaviour. Women are the ones that are stepping on eggshells around him all of the time because of his various different ways of control, not just the physical and sexual violence, the emotional violence and the social violence. For some men, it's about them knowing that, well, we're actually starting to watch you, and not that we're wanting to make them out to be monsters or anything like that, but for some men, it's actually more about them knowing that if they continue behaving the way that they are, there'll be consequences for them. But for other men, yes. In a number of men we work with in men's behaviour change programs, they do express a genuine desire to be a, a better father. I even mean, remember one man in the Men's Behaviour Change Program says that he doesn't want to go out with a doormat. He wants to go out with a woman who will speak her mind, which was pretty hilarious given the emotional <laughs> abuse that he was using against her. You know, he was making her too afraid, <laughs> too afraid for her to speak her mind. But for some men there's a difference between really deep down, you know, what they, what they want for their family life, for some men, they're really realising that their life is very narrow and time is ticking away and they're actually missing out on intimacy and compassion. There's a difference between that and their behaviour. So sometimes, some men get that difference. They see 
how their behaviour sabotaging what they really want in themselves and their families. And for some men, they start to see their family members as real people. They start to see them as human. It can take a while, but for some men, yes, it is possible to work towards behaviour change, but not for them. Ken, we've talked a lot tonight about attitudes, and I just wondered how you think um, we can challenge the uh, attitudes in what can be a male-dominated, blokesy kind of she'll be right workplace, which I guess is a, a challenge for you. Um, yeah, thanks, Fiona. Um, it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy. Enough. Rodney's point about um, there's a culture that's developed for centuries and centuries and we find ourselves in the position we are at the moment and to change, I, I know my organisation to, to, to drive a change um, it can be slow, it can be frustratingly slow um, and it can be difficult but um, we need that leadership, you know, you need to actually be constantly um, sharing that message with your people about um, what's fair, what's proper, what's respectful, what's not. And when you see those, when you see those behaviours that are not acceptable, that people are held to account. Um, from, the, from, from our operational piece though, Fiona, um, this is probably a bit broader than your question, um, I worry that um, many see the solution at the police end or the court end, um, where we know that at that other end, at the education end, the family end, where people, are where people actually learn their behaviours. Um, if we get that right, it can actually make an enormous difference, an enormous difference down the track. But um, within an organisational perspective, and I think I think you've seen it. Um, whilst uh, it's easy to um, have a go at organisations like the AFL. They have actually changed um, quite dramatically some of their thinking mm -hmm. and the way they train their people. You look at the armed forces who constantly get they have, have been faced with some really difficult, difficult um, challenges. Um, the leadership um, that's shown by some of their leaders have been quite exceptional and is actually driving the change not only in their organisation but outside their organisation.